So my, well, thank you for accepting our proposition, which is experimental taphonomy, is cooking processes or post-depositional alterations. Um, well, mainly we begin with two questions when we began with this project, which are, we wanted to know whether we could differentiate human made from wildfires when it came to thermal alterations. And then we also wanted to know whether we could distinguish when we find um, predepositional and postdepositional conditions. We wanted to know if it was a possibility. And also made us think about cookie modifications and food preparations. We always um, go by the changing color that we normally see in bones. But we know that we also boil food as humans. So that was another one of the questions we had regarding our experimentation. Uh, so we established a series of experiments that we took place in the National Museum of Natural Sciences. We had to work with a muffled furnace, unfortunately, because they didn't allow us to make fire. So it was getting out to start and um, to learn uh, whether these alterations actually take place. And um, then we used samples from animals prepared by us in the archaeology archaeobiology laboratory at the Institute of History. So we are always going to be working with weather sheep bones and then fresh, well, rubber pond, well, bones and flesh as well, and mouse carcasses, okay? So in the first place, regarding what I was talking about boiling, uh, we go back to Tim White's um, prehistoric cannibalism at Mancos, published in 1992, when he had been working on an, an Asasi registry and he noticed that there were some modifications in some of the bones and he came to the conclusion that they had been formed by the direct contact between bones and the inner side of this pottery where it had been kicked and so he said this could be probably found at others Mm, registries, but it had been misidentified because everyone normally tends to think that they are caused when we are preparing tools. Um, so he went ahead and he did a control experiment in which he balls on deer bones and he actually could replicate. So he did show that it was possible to notice when bones had been boiled and so prepare for cookie or other things, sorry. Um, but he also noticed that you could not quantify these marks because it's going to depend on things such as how long they have been boiling, the type of pottery use, the degree of movement, that is, if you had a stirred. Um, so in our case, we did three experiments in this case. We did one which unarticulated rabbit leg, another one that was a rabbit leg disarticulated, and a third one which was with dry bones because you don't always work with flesh. Uh, we put them in bowling for four hours and we didn't stir them, unlike in previous experiments done by other researchers. And we found that in the case of the articulated leg, Unfortunately, it got stuck inside the crossable we were using, so there were no marks. However, when we came to see the disarticulated bone and the weather chip bones, even though there had been hardly any movement and we thought we weren't going to see any marks on the bone, we actually found that you could very clearly see, even in the, only in the magnifying glass, where they had been in contact whether it was the bottom of the crucible or the sides. So actually you can notice when something has been boiled. And this was the first part of our experiment. Parting from that, we went on to work with the discoloration of the bones, which was more widely worked with from, by other researchers. As you know, it has been clearly established that bones go through different grades of color changing and it goes first black then gray bluish and then white so going from this and knowing what was the expected color pattern we went on to expose some of them to to direct temperature high temperature exposure we did so on the one hand with legs of rabbits that had been half flesh and half the flesh and of course we did 
um, the outcome was the expected one. We got at 300 degrees for 15 minutes, it was shard, so it was black. Then we got the bluish gray and then the gray white. We could establish that the furnace was working appropriately. The same thing happened when we work with some mice carcasses. Again, with 15 minutes, 300 degrees, 600 degrees, and 750, and we got the expected pattern. But our actual question was, may sediment affect bone discoloration? So what we wanted to know is, when um, these elements are buried, is there a difference in the way they act or the outcome of the bone? So here you have a short overview of what we did. In the first uh, one, in the first experiment, we cut these rabbit legs and we put them inside the crucibles. Um, they were buried in different sediments. First, you have the mixed sediment, the, the gravel, sand, and silt. Why? Because we wanted to know um, whether there was a difference between the outcome with different sediments. You can see that more or less we got the same results in all of them because they were put in the vertical position, the top of the pot and the the flesh part was at the top and they all came out white because the moment that the meat began to disappear, there was a movement within the sediment and it all fell down as did the leftover meat. And so the, the air began flowing and it allowed for the top part, which was free in a way, now that the sediment has moved, to become calcinated, or calcines, sorry. Meanwhile, in the bottom part, we only got to the shard state. And we also found all the ashes and leftover meat. So more or less, we got in all of the sediments the same uh, result. However, when we came to do the same thing with my, well, mice, which had been put in the horizontal position within two same crossables, um, in the first case, we used sand in all of them, but using different um, temperatures. So we got the 300 ones, 600, 750, and the 900. Um, we found that even though in previous results when it was direct exposure, we got the white color at 750 degrees, it didn't happen here. Instead, we had to wait until we got to the 900 mark in order to get the calcined color. So we believe this is the result of the homogeneity of the sediment, which made the, the process of calcination be delayed. And so we had to wait from 750 to 900 degree. Now, when we did the same experiment, we repeated it, but with mixed sediment, we see that there was no white bones at all during the process. All the time, the only thing we got was the shark condition. We believe this is due to the anoxic conditions created by the different degrees of sediments in which um, the different sizes from the gravel to the sand to the silt will have made it impossible for the air to flow. And so the lack of oxygen will have meant that there is no calcination involved. As you can see here, we have the same temperatures, but there is indeed a difference when it comes to the sediments in which um, these carcasses were buried. Now, unfortunately, these are only the preliminary results. We wanted to have brought to you a more in-depth view of this matter. However, we couldn't do some technical difficulties over the summer. But what is next for us, what we want to see is compare in the same, uh, through same analysis, the different bones, because one of our questions is whether when, once you analyze close enough the bones, if the different sediments left a different pattern on the surface of the bone. So our question is, could we maybe in the future when we find these bones, learn whether they were altered because they were in a, in a given context? And also, of course, what we want to do then is put this to use by checking the results that we obtain with the different archaeological collection that we have at the Institute of History. And um, so check when we can identify that the term alterations were caused by 
um, human activity. At the time being, what we have been able to do so far is Yolanda Fernandez Halvo has been already using this mission in the Wonderbed Cave in South Africa, but I'm afraid we will have to wait uh, to have further answers to your questions, but thank you for having us.